<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Professor Joe A. Brooks, Professor Emeritus of Nursing for the Purdue University of Ball History Program. This is part two. It took place on Tuesday, October 5th, 2010 at a residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome, Professor Brooks, and thank you very thank you much. You're very welcome. Uh, let's start when you were the acting head and then go into when you were the head of the School of Nursing. Okay. Uh, I became acting head pretty unexpectedly. Uh, <laughs> Many are called, right? Yeah, it was uh, budget time, and uh, you can edit out whatever you don't want on there. Okay. Uh, and the dean had given all the department heads, although we were school of nursing, we functioned like a department in, in the School of Pharmacy, Nursing, and Health Sciences. Uh, and so he had given us the but had given the heads the budget, and they were supposed to make some cuts and do some things and. Uh, apparently, uh, the previous head hadn't uh, done what he wanted to do, and they had had a couple of go-arounds, and I guess finally one day in exasperation, he just said, well, I, d I just can't work with you, so I'd like for you to step down. And so I was one of the assistant heads, and so he called and asked me if I would step in and do that, and I said, well, I don't know anything about the budget, and she, he said, well, You'll learn pretty quickly. So uh, I scheduled a, a meeting with uh, the former head and sat down in her office. And I actually had had blocked off the whole morning because I figured, you know, it was going to take us all morning to get through the budget. I was out of there in 20 minutes. I was dumbfounded. So I called Carol Cox, who was uh, the business manager for the three schools, and uh, told her what had happened. And she started laughing. And she said... <laughs> Joe, I could have told you that. She doesn't have a clue how the budget works. So I had my first lesson in putting together a budget, and uh, Carol basically walked. And it, it's really just a formula, the way Purdue does it. You know, it's it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so uh, Carol sat down and walked me through it, and then I had a prepared budget to give to the dean, and he was pleased with it, so we got off to a pretty good start. Yeah. Uh, that year that I was acting, uh, they were, uh, search committee was formed in the fall, and of course they advertised all fall, and then they started bringing candidates in, uh, probably late January or early February. And I was so disappointed in the candidates that they had brought in. And some of these were people that I had known through my professional association. Sure, you've been around the field. And I, you know, I, I kind of knew what they were up to and uh, what their reputations were. And uh, fortunately, uh, the committee couldn't come to a decision, uh, so they basically told the dean that you know they just couldn't find anybody. And so uh, he said, well, we don't want to get the wrong person in. It's, I'd rather go slow. And so he asked me if I would continue. And I said, well, yeah, I've kind of got the feel for it now. So, you know. So we continued another year. and. Uh, they started bringing candidates in that time in the fall because they were hoping to fill the position by the end of the semester so that the person could start the new calendar year off. Uh, and they brought in a couple of candidates, and I thought, my gosh, these people are after my job. And that's when I realized that I really kind of wanted to have the job. So I called the dean and, and uh, told him what had happened, what a, the awakening that I had had. He just chuckled. He said, I was waiting for you to wake up. And uh, so he said, well, you throw your name in the hat and you'll be just like everybody else. You'll interview with all the department heads and do a presentation and just, just like everything else. And uh, so I went through the process and uh, was selected uh, and was asked to serve um, as, the act, as the head of the school nursing. And uh, the dean had sent what he called an offer letter it didn't look like an offer letter to me. I, I wasn't quite sure what it was. And uh, so about three days after he'd sent it, he called me in and he said, Joe, did you get my offer letter? And I said, well, that memo that you sent me on like the whatever day it was. And he said, yeah. I said, well, I didn't know that was an offer letter. Well, he said, uh, yeah, it was. Do you yes, still you have it? Can't won't go out yeah, the no, he won't. He can't go out the front door. Okay. He can go out the side door where it's all fenced in. but. He likes to look out the door. And uh, so he said, well, you look it over and then call me back if there's anything, you know, that we could add. 
So I looked it over and considered at that time as an offer letter. And of course I knew what the budget was and I knew how much money was allotted for the head salary. And uh, I said, you know, I, I don't think that salary's where it should be. And I said, unfortunately I know what the budget looks like and I know there just isn't any room and I don't know whether there's any way you can come up with a little more or uh, if there's something else we can negotiate for. So he said, well, let me talk to Bob. So he called Bob Ringle and he said, no, we don't have any more money for nursing. Rah, 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 rah. So I had been anticipating that and I thought, okay, what's more valuable than money around here? And I thought, a parking place. So I said to the dean, well, how about this? If you can arrange for me to have a reserve parking place, I'll take the job. He said, well, only associate deans can have parking spots, reserve parking spots. And I said, well, then I guess all you'll have to name me as an associate dean. <laughs> oh, so I, I tell everybody who's been in the position now that they can thank me for the reserve parking place. <laughs> Well, that brings up the point that what is the tie-in? I mean, you are, was also their title as head of nursing, but also associate dean for the three schools right. there. Yeah. Well, that was just so I could get my reserve parking place. Oh. But nursing did, there was a tie-in. I mean, there was some affiliation with pharmacy, wasn't it? Oh, yes. He's the dean of pharmacy, right. pharmaceutical sciences, and health nursing. science, and nursing. nursing. That's what right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so he had uh, two associate deans, uh, and so, you know, it just was... Sure, it's just the way it was. Well, yeah. Now, it's, of course, it's all changed with the new yeah. the new, the new yeah, college new colleges. Have, yeah. Have, right? yeah. yeah, Well, now you're on board. So, what about some initiatives and challenges well, in moving forward from acting to full? I'm in charge. Yeah, kind of a scary feeling initially. Uh, one of the things, because uh, I was named like in the May, so I kind of had all summer to kind of get things figured out what we wanted to do. Um, I knew we had a National League for Nursing accreditation visit coming up the following spring, so we certainly needed to get cracking on that and get that going. And uh, since I had been an assistant head, I needed to replace that position, and the person that was the assistant head for student affairs, just, just she just wasn't up to the job. She, you know, sometimes you have students that just can't make it, and you just, the kindest thing is to just tell them and ease them out. But she just could never do that. So, you know, we had students who had taken nursing courses multiple times, which was yeah, a waste of everybody's time. You know, these kids... Especially just, theirs. Yeah, they just weren't going to make it. But they just, you know, so I said, well, we, i got to get somebody in there that can really get a hold of this. Because I had a file that I called Problem Students. And I had 40 or 50 people in there that were just in my office or the faculty was in my office whining or complaining about them or something all some, all year long. So I thought I got to get I got to get rid of this. It's taking too much of my time right. for one I don't thing. Blame you. Non-productive. So, <laughs> exactly. So I was sitting out in my garden. I love when I'm thinking. I love to sit out in my garden and weed. Sure. Cuz you know, it's just thoughtless. So I'm weeding. I'm not one weed, about, two weeds. There you go. Uh, who would be good for that? And I came up with two people that I thought would do a good job in those two positions. And I asked both of them, and uh, one said yes right away. Uh, that was Dorothy Stewart. Uh, she took my position, so she was assistant head for academic affairs, which included overseeing the curriculum and all that kind of stuff. And then I asked Sandy Irvin if she would be willing to take on the uh, job as assistant head for student affairs. And she said, well, let me, let me talk to Susan about it because that would mean a calendar year appointment she had been used to having her summers off. So apparently they talked it over and decided that, yeah, you know, that would be a challenge for Sandy, and she was ready for a challenge, you know, although she loved teaching, but, you know, you get burned out, you don't need something new to do. So they both came on board, so then we spent uh, probably most of July trying to figure out how to get everybody on board in the fall, and so we decided we'd have a retreat. So we went to Turkey Run State Park, spent a little of the school's money, and uh, that's the first time the school had ever done anything like that. Faculty were just dumbfounded that, you know. <laughs> and uh, How long was the retreat? Two uh, days? Or? Two days, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And we had a couple people who couldn't, couldn't make it, but the rest of them came. 
and uh, I basically threw out the challenge about you know what we needed to do, what we needed to look at. Uh, you know, one was uh, the admission standards. Did we need to look at adding a math? Because med surge faculty continually told everybody that would listen that we needed to add a math class as a requirement to come into nursing because so much of what they do in med surge, you have to have math skills. So we beat that around the bush several times and finally decided that uh, we wouldn't make it a requirement, but we would strongly encourage it and preference would be given to students who had that. Then uh, we had to have a group looking at the uh, NLN accreditation business. So that meant really a curriculum review before we could really start writing the report. And uh, it was interesting, one person volunteered to chair that group up and once she did that then several other people you know volunteered to be on it but it was actually Jean uh, Kirkpatrick who volunteered to head up that committee and she did a superb job she really got into it and really did pull the roars and did it huh yeah yeah, yeah she really did uh -huh. so uh, then based on their work then over the summer we spent the summer then tying it all up and you know mm -hmm. change, getting getting it into the language that the league wanted uh, we had never had a league visit in which we had not had recommendations. We had, you know, sometimes it was, you know, one year accreditation with progress report due at the first year. So we'd never gotten the full eight years accreditation in the history of the school. So I thought, oh, if we can just get minimal recommendations, I'd just be the happiest person alive. Uh, so we worked on the summer and, oh my gosh, the drafts we got were just, oh, they were just dreadful. I mean, they were just, I thought, oh my gosh, these, they, just, they just can't write. They don't know how to write. And well, I thought, well, they've never written anything like this. You know, they've never had that experience. Uh, the former head, she and uh, the person who was kind of her assist, administrative assistant and did the development on the side had written the last two reports themselves. And uh, so I said, well, let me take it home this weekend and see if maybe we can just do some cut and paste and then actually most of it was there it just was not in the right place sure. and so you know it was just a matter of putting things together and then writing transitional paragraphs and so um, so we, it flows yes exactly so uh, so it had a, a, a beginning a middle and an end because the way it was before it was just so chopped up you just couldn't follow it it looked like the the curriculum was a patchwork instead of being a, you know an organized like curriculum. I had, a, I had an idea and we'll put it there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Follow the dots. Yes, that's exactly what it was like. So <laughs> uh, then we had that at the retreat for everybody to look at and to critique and get you know get their feedback in before we had it, the final draft printed and sent off to New York. So uh, we focused on that at the retreat. The other thing that we focused on at the retreat was. Uh, retention of faculty and how we could help faculty get promoted and get tenure and um, you know what sh what should the school do should we uh, set aside some money to financially support them in term and what kind of support did they need you know they need uh, research assistance did they need someone to go to the library and pull out the references form did they need help with typing and what do they need so all the people that were enrolled in doctoral programs I asked, they, got, they were in one group, and I asked them to just make a list of anything that they could think of that would help them. And so, oh gosh, we had everything from babysitting to <laughs> coming in and cleaning my house. So, uh, but out of that, we did prioritize and identify several things that um, I thought we could, the school could afford to do. And the faculty, by and large, were, were willing to go along with that. And part of it was just freeing some of them up from some of their clinical time so that they would have more days, you know, more time to focus. Because you can't go to the hospital and spend eight hours, actually it ends up being 10, with a group of uh, 10 students who all had patients that you had to know everything about. And then by the time that was over, you're exhausted. So, you, you know, it's just unrealistic to expect anybody to go home and do anything creative at the end of that right, period. Right. So um, we worked on that. There was a lot of resistance from the faculty who weren't pursuing graduate education because uh, they felt like they were being asked to support all those other people and you know I tried to convince them that you know that program would be there and when they were ready to go it'd be there for them sure and so you know it was 
uh, we weren't paying favorites. It's just that these people were at the point where we could actually do something to help them and get them through quicker so that we could increase the number of doctor prepared faculty we had. Right. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it went along and we got a lot of things going. Um, our site visit was scheduled for February. And so we had booked them a suite at the union and we had a gift basket for them and just all kinds of things. And um, How many, about how many? Just how many? two. Two, oh, yeah. okay. And uh, had a computer in the room for them and uh, just everything we could think of that they might need to make their visit, you know, as pleasant as possible. And uh, they turned out to be just wonderful visitors. They Did they, you know either of them? No, didn't oh. know either of them. Okay. Uh, they really critiqued us. They had a lot of positive things to say. Uh, they fussed about the organizational structure, but they realized that that was the university and there wasn't anything we could do about that. Uh, so uh, ended up that uh, apparently it was a pretty good report. So when they were giving their report then at the, at the league meeting, in, which is in New York, um, the schools always have a chance to send a representative. Well, Purdue had never sent anybody before. And I said to Dorothy, well, we're going because we need to be there. So if they have questions, we can answer them. Because if you didn't go, then you had to sit by the phone. And if they had a question, they'd call you up and you'd talk on the phone. Well, you know how hard that is to do. Your input, and, and you know that this means a lot by being your presence. Exactly. You know, it sends a real strong message that this oh, is real yeah. important to us. You yeah, know. right. So uh, off we went and uh, had a very good meeting. Everything went really well. And we were voted unanimous uh, for a full eight-year accreditation with no progress report required. Well, Dorothy and I were like this high off the ground, so we went out to celebrate at lunch. I don't blame you. You needed to do something oh, like that. We went to the most expensive restaurant we could find on that side of town and really Wonderful. had a great time. Wonderful. And uh, flew back. I had called then. I called Sandy and so she could tell the rest of the faculty that everything had gone really well and that we were going to have a full accreditation with no progress report. So everybody was excited when we got back, so oh, we had yeah. a big celebration. Bring out that. the balloons, right? There yes, you go. Right. yes, yeah. Terrific. Uh, the the other thing that happened while the visitors were here, and it was just pure coincidence, they were sitting out in the uh, waiting area, reception area, on a love seat that we had, and um, the mail came, and uh, my secretary, Lena, said, uh, Dr. Brooks, there's something here from the State Board of Nursing. So I went out to get it, and that class that took the State Boards that summer had passed 100 percent and so that happened just at the time they were there so it could have been better oh, oh what a, yeah that just was the uh, cherry on top of the oh cake. exactly I mean you know the Lord good Lord was looking after us that day so uh, so that was a very good year yeah and uh, what yeah. about the development is that your first year is that when you hired uh, uh, Mara? I think I hired Myra the following so, year okay 92 is what I've got yeah that around. sounds okay. about right yeah wasn't uh, development going within the university at that oh, time? Yes. Yeah, oh, was, yes. Cause oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, uh, it was started because when Dr. Jeske came, is when it more, he came when he, and of course, Dr. Barron was the president yeah. of, when you took yeah. over. And uh, we had, as I say, we had a person on the, fa on the staff, uh, one of the faculty member was a staff person, and she uh, helped Dr. Geddes with speech writing and did development. And her idea of development was just send a letter out once a year asking for donations for the school. And so when Mar, when we decided that, actually, uh, Joan Lohman decided that she was going to take early retirement, so uh, that gave me an opportunity to look around for a new person. and uh, To do so, it full time. Yes, yeah. So uh, we put an ad out and we had several people come in and interview. We had, a, we had several really good candidates. But Mara and I just hit it right off, and I knew that she was a person that I could work with, and so. Uh, and she'd been around the university too, for some reason. Yes. Wasn't she an o OLS? Or, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So she, you know, she knew the territory and she knew the culture, and she you knew know. people too around the oh, campus. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Which is very important. Right. Yeah. Contact. It opens doors. Yeah. So uh, she accepted the offer, and uh, so we set about. We kind of laid out a five-year plan of where we wanted to be. And she had lots of ideas in terms of fundraising. Some were kind of off the wall that I just couldn't go along with, but a lot of them I thought were very yeah. creative ideas. Did you start bringing your alum? Had your alumni been coming back on an annual basis? To uh, not really. Okay. Uh, we had an advisory board which was made up of alumni, but oh, okay. they met like twice a year. Okay. And many they, of them. Many I have mine about. 
oral history, we only meet it twice a year, too. Yeah. But we we keep in touch. I yeah. try to keep in touch by email. Yeah. So we wanted to strengthen that relationship because, sure. um, you know, several of these women were out in really high-profile jobs in other parts of the state and could help spread the word about yeah. Purdue. Yeah. And maybe they knew some people that had money, and so. Yeah. So we really started developing that group, and they got very active, uh, planned an event for homecoming and just uh, planned an event for the seniors before graduation to welcome them into the profession. So, you know, just a lot of cool things going on. Right. That helps. Yes, and uh, we had a couple people who had just graduated the following spring that I had had in my issues course, and one of the things that I just preached and preached and preached was, you know, you have responsibility as a professional to get involved in these organizations to help promote nursing. So apparently I did a good job of selling them because the two of them uh, volunteered to be on the advisory board, and they lived locally. One lived in Rensselaer, uh, and the other one lived in near Otterburn, I think it was. So they were close enough to get into a meeting was not a problem. You know, if you live in Evansville, getting up here for a meeting, it's, you know. So uh, the group got very active, um, organized themselves into committees, and really, and still today, they're functioning. They're a very active yeah, organization. Um, how about uh, technology? That made an impact. Did you increase the technology while you were there? The yes. Students? Uh, we... Uh, we got a grant from the uh, the Helen Helene Pugh yeah. Trust for some. Yeah, that came labs, that came books. yeah that came after me. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. But one of the things we wanted to do was to upgrade the computers in the learning lab, which is what the students used, and then also to upgrade the the faculty computers. And we had talked about we really like to have a computer lab in the building, so the students didn't have to trek over to math or someplace else mm -hmm. to do assignments, and. Uh, well, where in the world are we going to put it? Well, we had a classroom in the basement. It was next to the room that we had taken over for the nursing center. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a classroom that everybody hated. They complained every time they had that classroom assigned to them. By noon, it was sweltering in there. You just, mm -hmm. it was, you know, the heating and cooling in that room was just impossible. And Jim Blaise, they God love him, he would come over and sit in class morning and then afternoon and take his readings and he said, I don't know how they stay awake in the afternoon. It's so warm in here and if you've had lunch, you just like drop off to sleep. So uh, we looked at ways we could accommodate the nursing classes that we had in the building because the faculty didn't want to have to trek across campus for a lecture because they had to haul all their stuff with them. Well, there just really wasn't any good solution. So we kind of drew up several options. And uh, I went to the curriculum committee and kind of laid out what the problem was. And, you know, the, everybody was really excited about the idea of having a computer lab in the building because that meant we would have computer support uh, full time and lots of good things could come from that. But, uh, you know, I shared with them, you know, that there really was no place on campus and that the only thing that we could do was try to freed up some space in the nursing building. And I said, now, nah, I know you guys are going to think I'm crazy, but I would like to, for us to consider looking at giving them room, blah, blah, blah. And everyone said, oh, we can't give that room up. I said, how many times have I listened to you all bitch and complain about how you hated that room? It was too hot. It was too cold. You know, it was this and that. And... I said, no one wants to teach in that room, so what? why is it so so sacred? And they said, well, basically, we don't want to have to walk, we don't have to, we don't want to have to teach in another building, because then we have, in the wintertime, we have to get on our coats and our boots and traps across campus. And I said, well, you know, it's a decision um, that you have to make. Uh, how much are you willing to give up to have the computer lab? Well, they thought and thought and thought about it, and the curriculum committee at the next faculty meeting uh, made a recommendation that we do that. And uh, so once it came from them, then the faculty kind of reluctantly went along with it. Once it was in place, oh, they were just thrilled to death with it. But it was just getting over that hurdle. I remember Jane Kirkpatrick was head of the curriculum committee that day, and when she came in, when I came into the meeting, I really had all my ducks in a row. And uh, she said afterwards, she said, boy, you were really prepared, weren't you? I said, I don't go into a meeting if I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's right, right. So. Yeah, that's good. Uh, let's see. Uh, diversity. Um, 
You increased in, in ma males, more students, male students? In yes, the yeah. and also uh, Hispanic and, ah. and African American students. Okay. Uh, that was kind of a, a target population. So we had never really done much recruiting mm -hmm. uh, to go out to, but I knew that a lot of the departments and schools were going to Indianapolis and Chicago and, and holding these meetings for open houses for people to come and find out about nursing. And the university did, did a couple that were university-wide. So I went to a couple of those and I thought, you know, this is really a great idea because if, if I can get to talk to people, I can really convince them that this is a great place they ought to send their kid sure. to. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about, you know, other ways to do that and we decided, we had a lot of students who came from Indianapolis, so we decided that was really a target population that we ought to hit. And it's close. Yes, yes. So uh, we decided we would have a, uh, what do we call it? Update on nursing or something. So we invited, uh, we sent uh, invitations to the counselors of all the high schools in Marion County and asked them to uh, share this with students who might be interested in nursing. And uh, if they knew if someone was gonna come up, they'd let us know so we could have name tags and things ready. So we didn't have any idea how many people to plan for, you know, because we'd never done it before. Um, we had it at um, that hotel out there by the Pyramids. I can't remember where it was. Oh, okay. there. And you had it in Indianapolis. Yeah, we had it in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a terrible day. So we got down there and they had everything all set up. They had the coffee and they had the, the rolls and everything set up for us. I think we had cookies. We didn't have rolls. We had cookies and a variety of sweets and fruits and strawberries and that kind of stuff. And uh, so the time was supposed to be like from 1.30 to 3.30 because we thought, you know, if 3.30 if they stay and talk, that we, they'll get out of there by a little after 4 probably. So the first hour came and went and not a soul. And we thought, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Oh, here we are, we spent all this money. What if nobody shows up? Well, then they began to trickle in. And at the end of the day, I think we had 35 people who had come, which was, we had no idea what to expect. I so know, right. I was thrilled to death with 35. That's wonderful. And many of them actually were very excited about Purdue. Uh, a couple of them were fence sitters and I think we swayed them because they ended up coming. Good. And uh, we had a couple of <laughs> we had a couple of families who were big IU fans, and their fa parents had all graduated from IU, and uh, they they just weren't sure about sending their daughter off to to the foreign <laughs> that land, other you know, that other school. <laughs> and so I had to share with them that well, even though I was on the faculty at Purdue and was the head of school of nursing, I had my undergraduate degrees from <laughs> from IU. I do have mixed blood. Yeah, I do I have mixed blood. Like so. <laughs> <laughs> so that went off well, and and actually several of those students ended up being uh, in in their class ended up being the top students. Uh, one of them was selected to be the commencement responder at, 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 at commencement. commencement. Yes. Oh, how nice! And uh, they just won all kinds of awards. One of them won the uh, uh, one of the leadership awards for women. I can't think what it is now, which was the first time. Nursing had ever won any of those kind of awards, so you know, we were really proud. We really of this. did well. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that the weather. What was wrong with the weather? Was it a, a oh, it was a terrible slush. It was a terrible. It was like in February, so it was a terrible a cold, slushy, slushy cold day. Oh, okay, and you know we were going sixty five, and the roads were just oh treacherous. By the time we came home, the sun was out and the roads were dry. <laughs> so all in all, it was a good day. Yeah, it worked out then. Uh, let's talk about the school. Um, the regional uh, nursing at the regional campuses, which started in the '60s, which surprised me when I was doing my research. Yeah, uh, you make a comment on that. My, well, one I, of them at Fort Wayne was in '64. And Kelly met about '65. Yeah, I didn't know much about them at all uh -huh. until I got on the faculty, and then of course, then I knew about them and knew they sure. were there. The Fort Wayne camp was a pretty was pretty autonomous, but the uh, Cuddy Met campus and the and the West Lafayette campus were linked. Uh, organizationally, uh, we shared the curriculum, uh, so we had shared faculty meetings, uh, we had shared curriculum meetings. What about heads? Did they have a, uh, They had their own head. They had their own head, yeah. okay. Yeah, they had their own head. Uh, Joyce Ellis, oh, she was a character. Very large woman. Her husband was a state policeman. She had a heavy foot, you wouldn't believe. So she got pulled over frequently on 65 coming down to campus. and. Uh, 
she'd, <laughs> they'd pull her over and then they'd see who she was and they'd say, <coughs> Dr. Ellis, you have got to obey the speed limits. She said, well, we were running late and I didn't want to be late for the meeting. You know, so <laughs> of course. they always let her go, but oh, it was, uh, it was uh, a joke, standing joke with her. Wesco was another one too, then about 66, when then about the time that campus opened, I think they was in the Barker Memorial Center in Michigan City. Yeah, that I don't, yeah. uh -huh. didn't have what, any contact with. What's the with. liaison to in today for with the regional campuses? Are they still, each of them offering nursing they, programs? Yes, and they, off, they, they really function fairly autonomously. As uh, the campuses are yes, pretty much. Yeah, but uh, for the Fort Wayne campus, their promotions still come to West Lafayette and go through our promotion committee. Okay. So, uh, which just seems crazy to me, but that's the way they set sure. it up, so. Okay, okay. Um, then the, the uh, building that they had, they had the dedication in 77, and that's when it was changed to the, uh, the Helen Johnson Hall of Nursing. Right, right. Well, we uh, had received a, uh, Helen had gotten a grant from the U.S. Public Health Service to build a building so we could expand enrollment and uh, because Lafayette, didn't have all of the clinical facilities you'd wish for, so we wanted to do a lot of clinical things on site using simulations and one thing or another. Uh, so she wrote a grant and uh, actually got a reward. I can't remember what, what the amount was for, but that built the building. Uh, and of course, when you get U.S. Public Health Service or any federal money, there's always stipulations, and so there was a whole s string of Helen that Helen had to promise that the school would do. Sure. And one was, in fact, to increase diversity among the student population. Um, several, I can't remember what all they were. Um, so the building was just about completed. And actually, we had we had moved into the building, and they were planning the dedication. And um, rumor had it that the former head had envisioned that the building would be named after her. And I said, well, it's going to be named after anybody. It ought to be named after Helen Johnson. She's the one that started this whole thing. So she is she still really around? Yes. Oh. No. Yeah, she is still around. Uh, she lives in Bloomington, mm -hmm. uh, the nursing home. And but after she stepped down, let me backtrack a little bit. Did she stay on in the faculty, or did she retire? No, she you? retired. Oh, and then, yeah. then she left Yes. and went to Bloomington? Went, right. Yeah, okay. she into that IU retirement. Uh, oh, okay. I All can't right. think of the name of it either. It's all in right. my memory. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I thought, well, that's going to be pretty tricky to, to get this done. So, Aota Stokes was on the faculty at the time. I don't know whether you have met Aota, but she was soft spoken and, right. you know, the sweetest very person. Reserved. Yes. So, I thought she would be a very good person to carry that request forward for us. So uh, Joan Roman sat down and helped us write out a proposal to name the building for Helen and the rationale about why this was appropriate. And of course they seldom name buildings for anybody that's living. In those days they didn't, Not unless right, she I gave know. a lot of money. Oh yeah. But uh, you know Helen didn't give any money, uh, she didn't really have any to give. Uh, but she had worked so hard to get that program right. up and running. And, and she and put that program in place for the university. Oh, of course she did. Right. Yeah really put us on the on the map. Mm -hmm. So um, wrote out a proposal and uh, Aota took it over to Dr. Baring and uh, he read it through and uh, he thanked her and that you know he would share it with the board and uh, they would give it full consideration. So she came back and said well I, I did the best I could do. I said well Aota if anybody could do it you'd be the one. And she said they were just very kind to me and they had all kinds of questions about my relationship with her, with uh, Helen, and how long I'd been here, and all that kind of stuff. So apparently, she convinced them that Helen was just this miraculous person that ought to be honored. So I don't know how long it was after that she met with Dr. Baring, but uh, shortly after that, we did uh, get a yeah. phone call. I got a phone call from Dr. Baring that uh, the board had approved naming the building for Helen. Yeah. And so when we moved forward with our dedication ceremony, that was going to change things around. So we had to make sure we had her up here and her family. And but it was it was a wonderful day. She was just absolutely dumbfounded. Oh, I'm sure I'd love to have been there when she first found out about it. it would have been oh. really nice having having known her. Yeah. Her. Right. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. There. The. Uh, 
So 1970 is oh, the school was first accredited by NL, NL the National League about 75, and then you've got that uh, nursing honorary, the Sigma Theta mm-hmm. Tau, and that that's chapter. the Phi Beta Kappa for your profession. Yes, that's really nice. Yes, and yeah. you have a induction ceremony. Yes, and we have a very active chapter. Um, Good newsletter that comes out three times a year, mm-hmm. um, actually quarterly. So I guess that's four times a year, and uh, it's a, it's a very active group. Uh, again, they get very involved in the, with the uh, students. Um, they uh, they and the alumni group get together and uh, plan to have some sort of uh, treats for the kids during finals week. And uh, so, you know, it's an active group. Let's talk about the placement of the of your graduates now. Uh, are, what are some of the areas? Are there any new ones that they're going into, or? What, how has They're that changed? They're just everywhere. I, I don't think it's changed much. They have always just been in all kinds of positions. Just And there's uh, still a shortage, right? Yes, yeah. And our students really have a very good reputation. Uh, one of the students had gone to Texas uh, to interview at uh, MD Anderson Hospital because she was really into oncology. And uh, everyone told her, that you know, oh, it's tough to get a job there, you know, really. And... Uh, she said she was sitting in the waiting room, and she, there were a lot of other applicants sitting there. And she said um, this lady came out, and she learned later it was the uh, the uh, head of nursing, the director of nursing, secretary, and uh, came out, and uh, she said, I understand there's a Purdue graduate in this group. And so she put her hand up, and uh, she said, well, the, the director would like to talk to her. And so she thought, well, what in the world? And of course, the other students are looking at her like, well, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and she a went in. relative. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, apparently, they had had several graduates, Purdue graduates, and had been very impressed with the level of clinical skills and knowledge they came with. That they did not have to spend a lot of time getting them up to speed. And when she saw that Purdue on that resume, she wanted to talk to that person. And so she did get a job there, Good. and but gosh, we have students just everywhere. Yeah, I notice they really have to be techie today because so much is the computer when they're uh, checking it, the patients yeah. in the rooms and things, and you really have to know <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, a lot of it is it's all it's all computer controlled. In yeah, cases. and thank and heavens we have that computer lab because oh, yeah. now they can go down and practice on an electronic medical record with before they have to go to the hospital and face it up front. That's right. Because so they don't have time for on jo- on the job training, no, you know, no. or any specialized classes. No. For upgrades, yes, but not they yeah. expect you to be walking in on day one and be able right. to handle it. With those skills, right. yeah, exactly. Are many of them going on for uh, further graduate yes. work? Yes. I, I can't give you the percentage, but I, I right. would guess that it's probably 50% at least. Okay. Uh, what about teaching? Do some of them end up going into teaching? Some do. Um, because you have to have... Um, they would prefer that you have a doctoral degree. Sure. Uh, and we have, gosh, I'm trying to think, probably a couple dozen of our graduates who now have doctoral degrees. Right. Um, some of them in very uh, prestigious positions. One is uh, with the policy section of the Division of Public Health uh, in Washington, D.C., and she does a lot of uh, policy work. and uh, so. She's really made a name for herself and for Purdue. Right. Well, that's nice. That's yeah. good to know. Um, the, I'll talk about now the North Central, your nursing clinics in Delphi and Mona. Talk yeah. About how they, go ahead and talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, we started out. Uh, this is on your watch, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had the nursing center in the nursing building. And I think I may have told you last time that uh, we had an advisory committee that met twice a year. And about once a year, Helen would invite me to come over and talk about the nursing center because she just was very proud of it. She thought it was just a terrific idea. And I had done that two or three times. And uh, at one meeting, Brita Francis, who was the director of nursing at St. Elizabeth, came up to me after lunch and she said, Joe, we need to sit down and talk about this because she said, we, this is exactly what we need in Delphi. She said, I can tell you the minute the doctor's office is closed because they jump in their cars, they drive down 25, and they show up at our emergency room. And she said, most of them don't need to be in the emergency room. They just need someone to write them a prescription for cold or cough or something, you know, or antibiotics. And she said, they're just plugging up our emergency room unnecessarily. And she said, I think this would just be the ideal solution if we could get a, a nursing center like this started up in Delphi. 
And uh, I said, well, we don't have any money. And she said, well, we don't either. Well, of course, I knew the sisters had money, but they weren't going to part with it. So uh, I said, well, we'll just have to kind of keep our ear to the ground and see if we can, if we hear of anybody who's funding these sorts of projects. Because I said, this is a new concept, and there are people across the country that are really excited about it. And so there may be some funding out there. So, um, well, it wasn't a week, I think, that she called me and she said, I just got off the phone with uh, somebody from the State uh, Board of, uh, State Department of Nursing, State Department, the nursing section of the State Department of Health. And she said they are, uh, they have a grant application out for people to develop nursing centers in rural areas. And she said, that's certainly where we are. And uh, so she said, I had them send me the application information. And she said, as soon as I get it, I'll call you and we'll get together and sit down and see what we need to do th for this. So uh, she did. Uh, I went over and sat down in her office and uh, she, about halfway through our conversation, she said, you know, I just can't take this on right now, but I'd, I'd like for Nancy Edwards, who's on our staff and has just finished up her master's degree, to uh, come and kind of be the St. E. Uh, liaison. And I knew Nancy just briefly, just through professional meetings, but uh, I said, well, that'd be great. So uh, we sat down and read through the application and to see what they, what kind of information they wanted and uh, what the goals of the grant were. And we both said, you know, well, this is certainly something we can do. Uh, so we set about putting a grant together. Uh, we had about six weeks to put the grant together, which isn't very long. Uh, because we didn't really know the community that well. So we had to get the demographic data oh, yeah. that we needed to support that the need. That all has to go in. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, of course, the census data was like four or five years old, so there wasn't a lot of help. But uh, we met with the uh, director of uh, the welfare department. Uh, we dragged... Uh, in, in Delphi? Uh -huh, in okay. Carroll County, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was housed in, housed in Delphi. Um, met with the uh, school nurses, the high school school nurses, um, just anybody. And of course, when we met with the, the director of the welfare department, she had a couple of other people that she suggested we talk to. Right. And when we explained what we were hoping to do, they were just thrilled to death. They were all so excited. And you know, if there's really anything- They realized the need. Oh yeah, anything we can do to help, you know, you just let us know. And I said, well, I know that we'll need letters of support. So they were all ready to do that. and. Uh, the director of uh, the welfare department, Carol Miller, was uh, she was a whiz at getting things out of people. So she, we gave her a list of the kind of demographic data we thought would be helpful, and she had her staff. I think they went through by hand and tallied this stuff for us. Well, sometimes the old stuff you have to do that. They yeah, have computerized yeah. That's the only way to do it. Yeah, we all did it that way. One oh time. yeah, oh yeah. Been so, there and done it. Yeah. So uh, you know, she was very invested in in the uh, concept of the clinic. So we got, we got our grant in. Uh, we didn't get funded the first year, uh, but they recognized that we'd only had about six weeks to put this idea together. And they were very uh, enthusiastic about the site. They thought Delphi would just be the perfect location for one of these. And basically they kind of said, well, you know, redo this. Uh, these are the things we need to see included in the grant and, you know, we'll give you your money the next time around. So we uh, sat about getting that all done. One of the things we, we did was to meet with uh, the um, president of the Carroll County Medical Association. They met twice a year, once for a Christmas party <laughs> and once in the summer. So not, they didn't do a lot of business, obviously. But, but the uh, holidays is a good time. You yeah, know? yeah. so we, uh, we met with the president of the medical society and he just wasn't at all sure and he kept calling us, you girls, Nancy Edward said to me, if he had said you girls one more time, I was gonna smack him in the face. <laughs> well, he probably did, but she didn't. Uh, so he was he was not very excited about the idea because all he could see was, you know, we were gonna take patients from him and we kept trying to point out to him that the patients we were gonna take were the patients that he didn't wanna see because they couldn't pay. You know, every office had a list of people that they didn't want to see because they couldn't pay. Sure, right. And Arnett Clinic and the Dr. Dockett, who was um, practicing in Delphi, his practice had recently been bought by Arnett Clinic, and they definitely didn't want all those deadbeats, as they called them, um, coming into his office and not being able to pay. So uh, he was very supportive of the idea. 
Um, in fact, we uh, talked to him early on about if we got this grant, would he be, would he consider being our medical director? Because the nurse practitioners had to report to a physician who would oversee their, their records and, and their practice and make sure they were not extend, exceeding their boundaries. And he was, yeah, he said he was, he'd be interested in doing that. So we got our grant together and sent it off, and very shortly we got a notice that we had been awarded the grant to start what up. What was the length of the time for the grant? Uh, it was a year. Okay. Yeah, a year at a time. To get it up and running. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the first six months we spent uh, trying to f figure out where to put the place, right. uh, and uh, we, we both sensed that we wanted to be downtown because there's no public transportation in Delphi. And a lot of the clients that we were going to serve live close to the downtown area. All those old buildings have apartments up over them. And those were exactly the kind of patients that, that we thought we would, they would be coming to us. Uh, then we also met with all the, not just the medical society, but we met with all, every doctor that practiced in Carroll County and explained what we were doing, that this was intended uh, to meet the needs for the underserved and, and the unserved people in Carroll County and that we certainly didn't plan on taking insurance or taking any patients away from them, that these were truly indigent patients that we were set up to see. And there would be no charges for the patients? Well, we had okay. a flighting, that's one of their concerns. Okay. And I said, no, no, this is not free. They have to pay as they're able. We'll have a sliding fee scale. I said, basically, the federal government has a model and it's based on the poverty levels and how many children you have. So we'll, that, that'll kind of be our guideline. And. Uh, so, and I told them that, you know, Dr. Doggett had uh, agreed to be our medical director so that we would, someone from their group would be watching over our shoulder and watching what we were doing. And if they had any concerns, they could call him or they could call me. Sure. So we kind of got all our ducks in a row and uh, opened up, I think it was probably January or February of that mm -hmm. first year. And... Uh, we, the grant, uh, we had enough money to pay part of the faculty's, the staff's salaries. We had uh, money to pay for a secretary receptionist, which was vital. Oh, Someone's wow. gotta be there to answer the phone and you know do all that record keeping and that kind of stuff. And then uh, two of the faculty were going to be part-time on the faculty at the School of Nursing, and then they would work part-time at the clinic. And then I was donating my time, so I would go up and I, I did the evening shifts one, one night a week. So I'd get there about five o'clock on Wednesday and stay till the last dog came in. Sometimes it was 10 o'clock, but uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, but we didn't have money in the grant for uh, equipment. So Nancy Edwards is a great scavenger right up there next to me. And every time a doctor uh, retired in Lafayette, they either donated their old equipment to the School of Nursing or to St. Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, thinking that their students might be able to use them. And Nancy said, I know that there's a room in the basement that is just packed full of stuff. And I'm sure that they would be more than happy to let us have anything we wanted. So uh, Nancy got the keys to the room and we went over one Saturday morning. My husband brought the truck, parked it out near the back door of uh, this wing. And we went down and started rummaging through and, oh, I said, let's we'll take this and we'll take this and we'll take that and we'll take this. Finally scrounged up enough stuff so we could have an exam table in every room, a desk, a, a, a stand for equipment. Quite a pottery of stuff there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, I've got it hauled up there. My husband hauled it up and then uh, all the staff, their husbands all came in and helped us unload it and get it in place. Sure. Uh, but it was it was a fun time, you know. It was just I'm I'm a great scrounger. I'd love to get out there and try to find a bargain. So that was just right up my alley. Uh, most of them just couldn't wait till we could have enough money to buy new equipment, but I, I had a fondness for that old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I like old stuff. I agree. It's sort of fun. It's a challenge. Yeah, it has a history. You That's know? right. Yeah. There you go. And uh, so we got up and running. Uh, I think the first month we saw, well, there were some days we'd see maybe two patients, and some days we'd see ten. So it was very up and down, but the word was gradually spreading. And of course, all the social service agencies knew we were there, and so they were referring people to us. And the people that came would go home and tell their friends about this sure. wonderful place you would go. And these nurse practitioners were just wonderful, and they were they would listen to you. And uh, so you know, the caseload began really began to grow. 
And by the end of the first year, we had made enough progress that uh, toward meeting the goals we had set out and the increase in the client load that the state board discontinued funding. And after that first, second year of funding, it was just kind of automatic. We had to do a, send a, you know, an annual report, but it was just kind of a formality. Right. Because we were pretty much guaranteed as long as we kept Are you drawing uh, from outside Carroll County? Is there any limits on the, your patient uh, We were at that time. We oh. were drawing quite a few from White County, which is why then they decided to open up the center in Monon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, some people from Tippecanoe, knew, those people who lived up, uh, further further north the outer part of the yeah problem. who were closer to Delphi than they were to Lafayette sure, right. um, a lot and of they, people, were, they could also use it yes yeah yeah we didn't have any geographic restrictions and of course they all paid as they could uh, we had a, a fairly large group of uh, retirees uh, farmers who uh, came in uh, we started doing programs uh, offering free mammograms and free pap smears for uh, older women and most of them had never had one they didn't want to go to a male doctor and when the word got out that there were nurse pra women nurse practitioners who were doing these exams they just thought that was wonderful sure. so and once they got in then they would drag their husbands in if they had something that they needed looked at and then we started doing a prostate screening program and that again brought another group of men in and you know every time we did a screening program we pick up three or four new clients right. out of that. You'd group. have to have an open session just for screening for yes. that particular. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I yeah. See. Well, yeah. That's good. And that brings other people in. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know. And shows what the services are and what can be done. Yes. Exactly. And takes the edge off, you know. Yeah. Kind of thing. Is the Monon one uh, facility about as large as the Delphi? Or uh, no, it's not as large. Okay. Uh, I've only been up there one time, and I can't actually, I, I don't know how many uh -huh. square feet it is. What are what have been the hours? Are, you, is it, are the clinics open seven days a week? Uh, the Delphi Clinic is open uh, five days a week. Okay. Uh, eight to five, and then one evening they have uh, late evening hours. Mm -hmm. uh, they do close up over the lunch hour, which is I've never been happy with. But yeah, all the hard. physician's offices do it, and so... And yeah. uh, it's primarily because they want to eat lunch together. So uh, I used to, when before I retired, I would, uh, the days that I was working, I'd keep the clinic open over the lunch hour. And I'd always have somebody come in. Oh, sure, sure. You know. Sometimes that's the only time that you can get exactly. in. Exactly. The problem with a lot of places around here, everything is 8 to 5, and you know, many times it's hard to do there on a lunch hour, and you're just, you know, you're locked out. And particularly yeah. the hourly people, it's really hard. It's oh, all, yeah. you know, 8 to 5 thing. Yeah. So we have to, one evening, uh, and yeah. I think they're talking about expanding that to two evenings. I think it's been pretty popular. Right. And you got the Sagamore of the Wabash and yeah. the outstanding alumni. That's nice. The Violet Haas Award, that's kind of nice from the Council on the Status of Women. Yeah, that yeah. was a nice award. I was very surprised. Mara actually, I think, engineered that for me. So. Now, the Sagamore was, a, I think you mentioned it was yeah, a surprise. The clinic, yeah. The clinic. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's very impressive. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I know people yeah, have gotten it. It still hangs in there in the TV room. Oh, that's right. And uh, the Brook Center in Delphi, tell us a little about that, since we've been talking about Delphi and the clinic. How did that come about? Uh, that's recent. Yes, it's fairly recent. Uh -huh. uh, when Home Hospital um, had merged with St. Elizabeth, and then when they decided they were going to close, they sold uh, Home Hospital to the sisters and they got a nice pile of money. I don't know exactly how much. So they decided oh, they would set up a foundation. Insane, yeah. yeah, they would set up a foundation to uh, you know, use this money. Well, federal government requires that you give a certain amount away every year so that you're not a profit generating center. And so they had done small grants, uh, equipment grants, and the center, the clinic had had a couple of those to buy things that we needed. The, and endow the endowment that from the yeah, sale. Yeah, and uh, I don't know exactly who approached John first, but um, there was a committee from the board that really was struggling. We needed to find bigger facilities. We just outgrown the space we had. And uh, somebody said, well, if we could just get someone to build us a building and we'd pay rent, that would be, just be wonderful. And uh, somebody on the board said, well, you know, he knew that uh, that's one of the things that the foundation from Home Hospital, North Central Health Services Foundation was doing was those sorts of things. And, you know, he 
he'd talk to John and see if that was something they might consider. And apparently it was met with very positive, and so they began to talk and uh, then roughed out a design and decided that the building uh, really ought to be uh, interagency because we all were seeing the same clients. And so, you know, they wanted to have some of the social service agencies in the same building. Um, and that was really, I think, John Walling's uh, dream was to have all these under one roof. Um, so that was, the, that was what they were working for. And uh, the staff from all the agencies were very involved in designing the building and the traffic flow and how they wanted the things set up. Uh, the nursing center has about a half of the building, and then uh, the uh, food stamp people, uh, the, uh, uh, what is it, Head Start, uh, a couple of other groups have mm -hmm. offices there. So um, they were, the building was pretty much done. I'd been up two or three times to look at the building. It was just, oh, it was just wonderful. They were so excited. I said, I may have to come out of retirement and go back to work. This is just too good to be true. And they were going to have all brand new equipment, and, you know, it was just like, oh. Uh, I was sitting in there watching television one evening, and the phone rang, and my husband said. You were at home here? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, talked a little bit, and then he put his, handed me the phone, and he said, it's John Walling. And I thought, what in the world does John Walling want? And so I got on the phone and talked to him, and I said, well, John, what's up? What do you want? He said, well, I want to ask you a question. And uh, he said, uh, you know, the building is just about ready to open up, and, uh, you know, we're going to have a dedication, and we've been thinking about what to call it. And I proposed that we call it the Brooks Center. And he said the foundation board was just very excited, thought that was a wonderful idea, but we thought we ought to ask you if it would be okay and I said, oh my gosh, John, I'm just, I'm absolutely speechless. I, I, I really don't know what to say. So that's how, how I found out about it. But I found out later that uh, several people in the community knew that this was going on, that uh, this was Things what they were thinking. Things were ringing. Yeah. Think. Yeah. But it hadn't gotten to me, so I was just really. That's nice. Yeah. That's the way it should be. Yeah. I think that's kind of good. That's really nice. Um, do you have a uh, favorite Purdue tradition? Uh, that you'd like to share with us, or an outstanding event, or both? Well, I loved going to the President's Council breakfasts before the football games. My husband thought it was just boring, but I loved just the atmosphere and seeing people, and of course the Glee Club always provided entertainment, sure. so that was always another chance to hear them. And of course at the end, every time we would stood up and sang Hail Purdue, and to be in that room full of people that love Purdue. And are dressed appropriately yes. for it. All Purdue regalia, yes. right? Gotcha. Yes, You know, it was just always very moving. Right, yeah. What about family? Do you have, and you talk about, your, for the research, you have the two children. Yeah, I have two children. Do you have uh, any grandchildren? Yes, I have oh. uh, four grandchildren. One daughter has uh, a little boy, Justin. Uh, she has lupus, and so she had real problems getting pregnant. Her lupus attacked her reproductive system, and so she had in vitro fertilization and they had tried several times. They spent enough money trying to have this baby, they could have sent it to Harvard. But uh, finally one took and so Justin was the result of that pregnancy and oh I tell you, I was in the delivery room when he was born and oh I tell you the look on her face. I know. Oh I know. my gosh, she was just the happiest person. How old is he now? Uh, he is uh, 10. Just the apple of everybody's eye, oh, you know. Of course. So. Yeah, right. Uh, such a sweet baby and uh, always has been and when he goes to school his teachers all just love him because he's such a little sweetie pie and very well mannered and very well behaved although he you know he can get into it he gets into it at home gets in trouble uh, then my other daughter has uh, two daughters and a little boy uh, Katie turned 16 last year so she's driving now Christina just turned 16 uh, in uh, September late September, and Ryan uh, is five, he'll be six in February. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. The, other, the older ones are closer in years than yes. they have. Yes, well, Laura uh, divorced her first husband, oh gosh, I think the girls must have been, well, it was just really hard for them. They were so mad at their mother that she was leaving their father that they just couldn't hardly see straight. 
It's and, hard. Yeah, it really is hard. And she had met a fellow that she just fell in love with. Uh, he was very involved in the arts, which she was, and uh, so they just hit it off. Uh, he had been married, but he was divorced when they met, and uh, she was still married when they met. She was she and Chris were not living together, but they were still married, and uh, so she and Eddie just uh, kept working at it, and finally. Laura told Chris that she wanted a divorce because she'd found somebody that she wanted to meet, that she wanted to marry, and uh, he was not real happy about it. Uh, Eddie was a professional dancer, and so uh, Chris is kind of opinionated, and so he kind of had Eddie all labeled and uh, wasn't sure that that was the person he wanted his his daughters around. But he turned out to be just the perfect match for Laura. He's oh gosh, he's such a creative guy, and he can learn to do anything. He figured out how to rewire their house. He's done plumbing. I mean, he just, he gets a book and reads he's it. He's the handyman. He's the handyman. Oh, yeah, is he ever. Right. And uh, so they were living in Indianapolis at the time and uh, had a lovely little house down in Irving, in the Irvington area. Mm -hmm. That's that's nice. Yeah. And uh, the girls went to a parochial school because the public school near where they lived um, didn't have a very good reputation kids would take guns to school and that sort of thing so Laura didn't want them going there so they went to a parochial school and had a good education and uh, then uh, gosh it's been probably five or six years now uh, she was working for uh, Ballet International and they just went belly up one day uh, one day everybody was working getting ready for their nutcracker performance and the next day they came and the doors were locked and Close signs okay. were this up. This is in Indianapolis. Yeah. Right? yeah, I remember reading yeah. that in the paper. Yeah, yeah. so they both worked there part time, uh -huh. and so uh, you know they just didn't know what they were going to do. And uh, she had been borrowing costumes from the Fort Wayne Ballet Company uh, when they were doing big productions, um, and they had always been very open, very warm, and uh, so apparently when they found out that Laura and Eddie were without jobs. Um, they called and asked her if she would be interested in becoming the director of their ballet school. And uh, she said, oh, I don't, I'd have to move to Fort Wayne. And they said, well, yeah, definitely you'd have to move to Fort Wayne. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she just wasn't sure, you know, about how Chris would feel about moving the girls that far away. And uh, by that time, he had remarried, and his wife didn't have any children, and she adored her stepdaughters, just adored them, and doted on them. I mean, they just were spoiled rotten with both of them. And her family just, you know, they were just all in love with these two girls. So uh, anyway, they decided that, uh, you know, they would they would try it. So they sold their house and moved to Fort Wayne and uh, been there ever since. Uh, when the recession hit, the ballet business kind of took a dive because mm -hmm. that's uh, discretionary money and when you're out of a job mm -hmm. and that's one of the things you can certainly give up. You can't give up food and groceries, but you can give up your ballet lessons. So they knew they were going to, uh, you know, not have many hours to work. So Laura decided that she needed to go back to school to get, to get prepared to do something else. And uh, two summers ago, Christina had uh, spinal surgery. She had very severe scoliosis, and Laura knew she had scoliosis. She just didn't have any idea how severe it was. And when they saw the orthopedic surgeon in Indianapolis, he showed her the X-ray, and her spine just like an S curve. And uh, he said, mm -hmm. you know, we really need to do this now while she's this, at this age because he said, she said, you know, she'll really respond well and uh, won't have any after effects. And so they uh, went ahead and did it. And uh, she was in the hospital longer than normal because for some reason she could not keep food down. And he wouldn't let her go home until she was eating and had a bowel movement. So she was there about 10 days, and uh, so Laura was there with her all that time. And she said, when she got home, she called me and she said, Mom, you know, all that time I was down there with Katie at Clarion North watching those nurses, she said, I've decided that that's really what I want to do. And I said, oh, honey, I can't tell you how thrilled I am. <laughs> yeah, nice. That's nice yeah. to hear. So that's what she's going to do. Yeah, so that's yeah. what she's doing now. So Good. That's she'll nice. graduate a year from this December, so. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think in closing, I'm going to leave it up to you if you have any suggestions or comments or looking at 
the nurse is a team member of the health care facilities or whatever. I'll leave it up to you. Well, I think it's fun. interesting. I didn't catch it, but uh, it'll probably I'll try to catch it on the news tonight. I was watching uh, Channel 13, uh, and I left the room to do something, but they were going to talk about the expanded role of nursing under this new health care reform. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to see is there going to be an increased demand for nurse practitioners, um, adult nurse practitioners, pediatric nurse practitioners, the whole gamut, um, because there are not enough primary care physicians to pick up the needs of all these people who are now going to have insurance and will be able to get care. Sure, right. So, and, it, uh, and it's paid for. Yes, yes, yeah. And uh, so I think, you know, that's just going to broaden the, you know, the future for the nursing centers and for nurse practitioners. And, right. yeah. and of course, once that becomes kind of the standard of practice for the nursing, then everybody else is going to want to move up to have that kind of degree. So, right. Quite an increase is coming. Yes. Uh, yeah. Enhancement and, and uh, their capabilities serving a wider population yeah, as exactly. a result of that. Yeah. That's good. So it's an exciting time to be yeah. in nursing. Yeah. I think so. Maybe I should you, Go made back right, you made the right choice. <laughs> yes, I think I did. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Well, you're that. very welcome.